May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear disciples and followers of Jesus, through the very difficult struggles in life, faithful disciples of Jesus are revealed. When you are going through a very difficult time in your life, when you are struggling it, and we all know it, then we learn pretty quickly whether you were following Jesus to get something out of him or whether you were following Jesus simply because he is Jesus, your Savior, and that is enough for you. Often in Jesus' ministry, we're told that the crowds would gather. The crowds followed him from place to place. At first, yes, they were amazed that he taught like one who had authority. They were interested in, in the words he was teaching, but it became very clear that they were more interested in the things he was doing, in the miracles. It was almost as if they, were, they had thought to themselves, well, I've got to go see this so that someday I could say to my children and grandchildren, right, I was there, yes, I saw the great rabbi raise the man from the dead. Oh, you should have seen it. However, when Jesus' teaching got to be a little difficult, when they really started pay, paying attention to his words, sometime about the middle of his ministry, they begin to peel away. The crowds begin to diminish a little bit more because those teachings were difficult and they didn't like the things they heard Jesus saying. And yet, there were those close disciples and apostles who kept following Jesus. Even though they didn't always understand what Jesus was saying, even though they didn't always want Jesus to go where he was going to go and do what he was going to do, even when on occasions they would try to prevent him, nevertheless, they kept following Jesus simply because they trusted that Jesus was who he said he was, their Messiah and their Savior. And that was enough for them. To the follow Jesus relentlessly then means that we don't follow Jesus to get what we want from him. Rather, to follow Jesus means we, we follow after him to receive what Jesus wants to give us. We follow Jesus to go where he is leading us. That's what it means to follow Jesus relentlessly. We follow Jesus simply because he's Jesus, our Savior. And that is enough for us. If not, why then we quickly become tempted by the devil, by the, by the lures of the world around us, and by the desires of our sinful heart, right? Not to follow him for who he is, but to follow him to try to get from him what we want and what we think we need in this life. And, and sadly, that seems to me to be where a lot of discipleship in our culture, our Western culture, has led. And it's not really discipleship. It's a delusion of discipleship. There are, are many people around the world, Christians around the world, living in like third world countries who know better than me, we, what it is to truly suffer. You know, they, they live without many of the conveniences of life. They've lived in lands that are ripped by struggles and warfare. They, they faced real persecution and struggle on a level that people in our culture have never seen. Their discipleship is far different than than many in our culture. Because so many in our culture aren't following Jesus because of who he is, 
but rather to get something out of him. And when we don't get what we want, why then we, try to, we, we often are tempted to follow somebody else and take another path. Well, friends, today Jesus is again calling to us. He's saying, come follow me relentlessly wherever I lead you. Let's listen to the words through which he tell, invites us. These are the words of our gospel this morning. St. Mark tells us, as soon as they left the synagogue, now this follows on the heels of last week's lesson. So it's the synagogue in Capernaum. Jesus has just cast out the demon. Remember? And now, after that happens, they, Jesus and his disciples, went with James and John, those are some of them, to the home of Simon and Andrew, other disciples, Peter and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Now, I, don't, I won't spend too much time on this miracle just to say, once again, you see the heart of your Savior, don't you? You see his compassion and his power. But remember, Jesus, again, is doing this as your righteousness. He's fulfilling God's law of love for you in doing this. So please treasure these words, seeing that Jesus is doing righteous things for you. This is what you now possess. That evening after sunset, so remember it was the Sabbath, so nobody was out walking the streets on the Sabbath, but after the Sabbath was over at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. Now, they probably didn't know that Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law at this point. All they had heard is that he had cast the demon out of this man in the synagogue. And now suddenly this huge crowd, the whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. He would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now, we understand that from last week's lesson, right? Jesus didn't want the truth being spoken by demons who are liars because that just makes the truth a lie, doesn't it? But we, might, we, we often have a question about this, and I think when we read through the Gospels and we think, why were there always so many sick people? It's like everywhere he went, he would heal all day, and they'd still have more sick people to bring him. So we need to be a little generous or kind with the people and, and recognize they didn't have the doctors, the, the, the medical system that we do. Right? And often, they didn't know that anything was wrong until it was really wrong, and as we've come to learn, it might have been too late. And then that would explain why there were always so many sick people. I don't know that it's really any different in our day. If Jesus would come to Victoria, I think we could probably find a lot of sick people to bring to Jesus, couldn't we? What's the difference? Well, the difference is, yes, we have medical, a medical system that has helped us greatly, uh, deal with the symptoms of a sickness or perhaps put it off. But many of us, because of that same sickness, know we're sick long before we feel it. Huh? So I I'm going to guess there are probably any number of people here this morning who might feel okay, but you know, you're on medication for something, right? And if Jesus showed up, you probably go to Jesus and say, Jesus, could you cure me of this? Huh? So it wasn't any different than it was for the people of Capernaum. Very early in the morning, then, it tells, after Jesus had done all this healing, one of the Gospels tells us it went way into the night, so Jesus had a very short night's rest. He got up very early in the morning, while it was still dark, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, again, it's a great example that Jesus shows us here. It, it's a wonderful thing to take time every day, and if you have to steal it, steal it from your morning hours, and have some alone time in prayer with Jesus. Uh, that works very well for me in my life. I can tell you that, but whatever that is for you, Jesus is giving you a wonderful example to follow. However, remember, once again, when Jesus is doing anything in the gospel, it's not only to show you, give you an example, it's primarily to do it for you. So for all the times you failed to devote that time in the day to prayer and talking to God, Jesus did it for you. See, he took the early morning hours. He did, that's your righteousness before God. So see that above all things in, in Jesus. But the other thing I'd just quickly comment on here is that it's a solitary place. Uh, someone said, and I don't remember who, but so, being alone, solitude, right, is a blessing. 
that you have time to, to just be alone and, and you know, have one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus or maybe one-on-one -on -one time with your thoughts to just think things through. That's a blessing. But loneliness and isolation are curses. And that's why as brothers and sisters in Christ, if we notice someone is isolating themselves, if, if they're suffering from loneliness, we certainly want to be there as the body of Christ, the family of believers, to welcome that back in so they are not lonely and isolated. That's the devil's workshop, isn't it? So anyway, it's, it continues. Simon and his companions, the other disciples, went to, to look for him. Now, again, this look for him, and then when they found him, everyone is looking for you. Right? That's, everyone wants to see you. It, just an interesting comment here in Mark's Gospel, this word looking for, that, that's used in the Greek. I, I'm not, there's no judgment on anybody's motives here, in, yet in this context, because it's still very early in the ministry of Jesus. But Mark will use this word many other times in the Gospel, but every other time he uses this word looking for, it's always with evil intent. They were looking to trick Jesus, right? Or they went looking for him because they had some nefarious scheme afoot, right? So that's how the word is used. Otherwise, it's the only time that we're aware of in Mark's gospel that it, it, it may not ha necessarily express an evil intent. What does Jesus say? He replied, well, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Now it's almost as if Jesus seems not to care about those people in Capernaum. He wasn't able to reach the night before, but that's not the point. See, what, what's the point here? Jesus didn't come to be doctor, you know, hang out his shingle in Capernaum and, and create a healing ministry. That's not why Jesus came. That's not why God sent him. That wasn't the purpose of the miracles. Right? It was always to point that to him and to his greater work. And he tells us what that is. Right? To preach the gospel. To announce to them that the kingdom of God had come near. So, it's that last statement that I think we, we want to think of at least for just a few moments. That is why I have come from heaven. You see, the people... And the disciples wanted Jesus to do what? To heal them. They had gathered as crowds the, the night before. And it's the first time in Mark's Gospel that we hear of crowds gathering around Jesus. They wanted more of the healing. The disciples thought it was a good thing because, hey, their friend Jesus is gaining in popularity. Hey, let's... Try to keep that going, right? Try to keep the positive media going. But they wanted Jesus to do what they wanted him to do and go where they thought Jesus should go. They wanted Jesus for what he could do for them. And, and, and notice, as sincere as their faith may have been, as pure as their motives may have been, they were still misguided, weren't they? And that's what Jesus is pointing out to the disciples. He had come not to be doctor in Galilee, but, be to, to, but to be the proclaimer of good news to all people. The reason Jesus had come was to reconcile to God and to redeem for God all the people in the world. No doubt that's probably what Jesus had been praying for in the morning when he had offered those prayers. And that's what he then needed to teach his disciples when they came looking for him. So you have in mind what, what you want to get, but there's this other thing that God sent me to do. It's even more important, isn't it? So why do you follow Jesus? Do you follow Jesus simply because he... He is Jesus, your Savior, period, full stop. Do, do you follow Jesus because you know where he's leading you? Because you trust him in every stage of your life to do what is always best for you? 
because you trust that Jesus is always keeping his promises to you. I think we all would say that. I, I can't imagine anybody saying, oh, that's not why I follow Jesus. Um, we, we all want to believe that's why we, we follow Jesus. But what then happens when the bills start to pile up, especially the medical ones, right? They, they, they're the ones that come with a little bit of a surprise, and then you look at it and you have sticker shock when it comes. Oh, how am I going to do that now, huh? Uh, and, and insurance keeps, seems to keep covering less and less, and the bills keep bang, getting higher and higher, and now you're in a real pickle. Well, what then? Or maybe you've discovered that the government has found a new way to take even more of your fixed retirement income from you, even as the medical expenses go up. And you wonder, how, how, how do I even maintain a, a level of life that, that, that I was living? Or some of you younger ones may have a career path chosen and set out for yourselves, but you recognize that the coursework it's going to take to pursue that career is getting more difficult and more difficult every year with the different classes. And you, you begin to wonder, how do you treat Jesus in those moments? Is it, Lord Jesus, I know that you love me and that you will take care, care of me and I will continue to love you and follow you and proclaim you to others. Not what I want, but what you want. Or is it, Jesus, you know, I have, I have done everything right. I have committed no major sins in my life. I could really use a solid right now, right? Some way for the, either the bills to go away or for the money to come in to pay those bills. Or, or, or I have sacrificed a lot of time and money and energy, Jesus, and and I could really use some kickback now because these things are getting more difficult for me. Now see, if you're like me, I'm just going to be honest, if you're like me, you probably have prayers that are more like the latter rather than the former. Huh? And, and it's, it's human nature. It's the, it's, it's, the, it's the way we do it. Now mind you, mind you, it is not wrong to go to Jesus and ask for the desires of your heart or for the things that you perceive that you need. In fact, he tells you to come with those requests, so don't stop. When you do that, you honor, you glorify him because you're saying to him, hey, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. You're the Almighty. You're the Powerful One. In fact, you're the Gracious One. You're the one who has compassion on me like a father has compassion on children. So I know you want to answer this prayer. That, that's, we're okay up to that point. But see, it, it usually doesn't stop there, does it? It's like, it's not enough to trust Jesus and his grace and his power. We got to throw something else extra in, don't we? And then we kind of show our real, our real selves. It's like, uh, yeah, I, I, I realize all that's true about you, Jesus, but consider my performance. Consider my merit. Consider what I've sacrificed, huh? And, and it's at those moments then that we, we turn our relationship to God into an ATM transaction, right? So put in the card, get something out of it. Or, or we start giving advice to God. Right? Well, now you listen to me, right? I'll tell you how this, is gonna, this should work. And that's when we cross the line. And that's when we commit very serious, grave and deadly sins. And it's at that moment that St. Peter would warn us, Right? Your devil is walking around like a roaring lion, ready to devour you. He wants to lead you away from your Savior. Because that's all he ever does. He wants you to, at that moment to go, Ah, oh, this discipleship thing isn't working for me. I'm going to go a different way. I'm going to pursue something else. But guess what? It's never going to get you what you want. It's never going to lead you where you want to go. The Lord Jesus did indeed come to serve you but he's never called your servant. He's always called the servant of the Lord. He's the one who came to do the Father's will. Which was what? Well, the Father's will was that he serve you by saving you. 
And that's what Jesus came to do. And in our gospel lesson, what God wanted Jesus to do, and probably made clear to him that morning in prayer, was what? No, you've got to keep moving. We're not here to be doctor, doctors of bodies. We're here to be physicians of souls, lost souls. So you need to go spread this message in other places. And so what does Jesus do? He does the will of his Father. Yes, that included serving people, just as he still serves us. But he's not our servant. He's our Lord and Master. He's the servant of the Lord who always does God's will. But you think about where that then led him. When Jesus calls you to follow him relentlessly wherever he leads you, he doesn't just say that lightheartedly. He knows what he's asking of you because he knows what it's like to commit yourself to doing the will of another. Because that's what he did, isn't it? He did the will of the Father in heaven who said, no, you must go to Jerusalem. Even when the disciples and everyone around him says, no, 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 don't go there. Right? They're going to try to kill you over there. And Jesus says, we must go. And he, and he rides into Jerusalem to face, behind the faces of people who had made him the enemies, the very real enemies of God and his people. The ones they couldn't see. The enemy of human sin. Yours and mine included. Along with the guilt and the shame and the humiliation that go along with those sins. That's what Jesus wore. That's what he went to face in Jerusalem. He also went to face the devil. To confront the devil for you and for me. To destroy his power and control over us. He also went then to face death, didn't he? His obedience in following the will of the Father cost him his life. But he gave it up. He gave it all up for you. And now you know that you have what God has promised that you now have. You know that you have the righteousness of Jesus to cover you. You have the forgiveness of all of your sins. The shame and the guilt are gone. The punishment is not hanging on your horizon. The control of the devil. He doesn't have it over you anymore. Those chains have been set. Now he's got to roar, roar around like, you know, walk around like a roaring lion. He's not the master who's got to get by the chain dragging you around anymore. But even death, even the grave can't hold you. That's where Jesus went. And God demonstrates all of this to you. How? By raising Jesus from the dead. There it is. There's what you get for following Jesus. You get the righteousness that you need. You have the forgiveness for your sins. Freedom from the control of the devil. Life here and life forever free from the, the everlasting chains of, of death. That's why Jesus did not heed the disciples' plea just outside Capernaum. It's why Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to do and go where they wanted him to go. That's why Jesus went to the other towns and villages. Because that is why he had come. And isn't this then also what faith-filled disciples of Jesus want? We want what Jesus wants, don't we? We don't want Jesus to want and do what we want because that doesn't go very well for us. By means of this account, the Savior is calling us, yes, come follow me, but he's really calling us first to repentance, isn't he? To turn away from ourselves and back to him, to turn away from our desires and to turn to following his desires, to turn away from following our hearts to following the heart of him who loves us and gave himself for us. And so he says, come follow me relentlessly wherever I lead. And what's our prayerful response? Lord, not what I want, but what you want. Yes, I will follow. Jesus' call to follow him is, is a call then not just to repent, but to keep trusting in him. To, to mimic the faith of the prophet Habakkuk, who said what? Who said, okay, Lord, I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep trusting you even though I see no evidence of you keeping your promises. I am going to keep trusting you e even when 
it looks like you're not even doing anything that you said you were doing. I'm going to keep trusting you, Lord, even when it looks like you're setting yourself up to be my enemy rather than my Savior. I'm going to do that because I trust who you are. I trust your words and your promises. Just like you said, the righteous person lives by faith. That's the response of a disciple. So keep following Jesus. Jesus relentlessly wherever he leads you. And why? Because the Father cannot love you more than to give you his Son. And the Son could not love you more than to give you his own life. And the Spirit could not love you more than to bind you to Jesus through baptism and faith. In him is eternal life, even life in heaven. Keep following Jesus relentlessly wherever he leads you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we admit it's, it's very difficult to give our whole body, our whole mind, our whole soul and, and life to you, to following you. We are so easily distracted by the desires of our own hearts and by the lures of this world around us and the temptations of the devil. And so too often we are half-hearted disciples disciples rather than full-hearted. We first of all pray for your forgiveness and trust that in you, through faith in you, we have it. But now we ask for your strength. Your strength and your poured out in your grace and your mercy for us. Compel us with your love to be faith-filled disciples so that we will follow you relentlessly wherever you lead, trusting that you are leading us exactly to the place you have promised to us and that you will give us everything we need. We ask this in your name. Amen.